Hi, I'm Anna. My life took a sharp turn five years into my marriage with Paul. We were your average couple. I was a teacher. He was a manager at an energy company, and life was pretty straightforward. Then his dad passed away, leaving his mom Elaine all alone in their family house. It was then that Paul dropped the bombshell. Anna, we need to talk, Paul said abruptly one night, his tone serious enough to make me pause mid-scroll on my phone. I looked up. What's up? Everything okay? He took a deep breath. It's about Mom. She's alone in that old house since Dad passed. I think we should move in with her. I felt my stomach drop. Move in with Elaine? She and I were like oil and water, Paul. Are you serious? You know Elaine and I barely get along. He leaned against the kitchen counter, his expression firm. I know, but she's my mom and she's struggling. Plus, we're just burning money on this rented apartment. I sighed, running a hand through my hair. But this is our space, our home. Moving in with your mom, it's a whole different ballgame. Paul's voice took on a pleading edge. Please, Anna, it's not just about the space. It's about family. Mom needs us. I bit my lip, feeling cornered. Your mom needs us or you need your mom. He frowned. That's not fair, Anna. It's not like I'm asking you to live in a dump. It's a huge house, plenty of room for all of us. I crossed my arms, feeling the tension rise. And what about our life here? Just uproot everything because Elaine snaps her fingers. Paul's tone hardened. It's not like that, and you know it. I'm thinking about what's best for everyone. I shot back, everyone or just Elaine. He threw his hands up in frustration. Damn it, Anna, can't you just try to see the bigger picture here? I glared at him. I am looking at the bigger picture, Paul. Our life, our independence. Not just playing happy families in that gloomy old house of hers. The argument went in circles, but eventually I caved for Paul for the sake of peace. But deep down, I dreaded every bit of it. Moving day came, and it was as uncomfortable as I imagined. Elaine's house was this imposing old structure with rooms that echoed and a constant chill in the air. Elaine greeted us with a stiff smile. Welcome to my home. I expect you to respect my ways. I forced a smile, trying to keep the peace. Of course, Elaine. We appreciate you letting us stay. But living with Elaine was like living with a hawk. She had a comment for everything. Don't put the dishes away like that, or you're overwatering the plants. It was relentless. One night, after a particularly harsh critique on my cooking, I exploded to Paul in our room. I can't do a damn thing right for your mother. It's like living with a drill surgeon. Paul rubbed his temples, looking equally frustrated. Anna, just give it time. She's old and set in her ways. I threw my hands up. Great, so we just tiptoe around her till the end of time. He didn't have an answer, and honestly, neither did I. This house, with its constant surveillance and Elaine's scrutinizing eyes, was suffocating. Life in Elaine's house was turning into a daily grind. Just when I thought I could handle it, Paul dropped another bombshell. It was a lazy Sunday afternoon, and I was trying to find some peace in the garden when he came out. Anna, we need to talk. I looked up, feeling a knot in my stomach. What now, Paul? He took a deep breath. I think you should quit your job and stay home. We're spending a fortune on a nurse and housekeeper for mom. It makes more sense. I stood up, anger rising. Quit my job, Paul. I love teaching. It's not just about the money. He ran his hand through his hair, his tone getting edgy. I know, but think about it. It'll make things easier around here. I shook my head, disbelief washing over me. So what? I just become a full-time maid and nurse? That's not the life I want. Paul's voice rose. It's not about what we want, Anna. It's about what's practical. My mom needs us. I glared at him. No, your mom needs you. I didn't sign up to be her caretaker. He shot back. Well, things change, Anna. We need to adapt. That word felt like a slap. I loved my job, my independence. This wasn't adapting. This was sacrificing. You know what, Paul? Fine, I'll do it. 
but don't expect me to be happy about it. He sighed, a look of relief crossing his face. Thank you, Anna. It means a lot. But it didn't feel like a victory. It felt like I was losing a part of myself. Quitting my job was hard, but the days that followed were harder. I was now a full-time housekeeper, nurse, and cook. Elaine, as always, had her two cents to add about everything. One day I snapped. Elaine was criticizing the way I ironed her clothes, and I couldn't take it anymore. Elaine, can you just stop? I'm doing my best here, I said, my voice shaking with frustration. She looked taken aback. Well, I'm sorry if I have standards, Anna. I threw the iron down. I'm not your servant, Elaine. I'm your son's wife. I'm here trying to help, and all you do is criticize me. There was a moment of tense silence, and then Elaine's expression softened slightly. I know you're trying, Anna. I'm just used to things a certain way, Elaine said softly. I sighed, feeling the tension drain out of me. I know, Elaine, but not you. I have my way of doing things. From that day on, things were slightly better. Elaine toned down her criticisms, and I tried to accommodate her quirks. It was a fragile truce, but it was better than the constant battles. As time dragged on in Elaine's house, the atmosphere grew tenser, almost suffocating. Paul's behavior became increasingly distant and elusive. He was always late from work, and when he was home, he might as well have been invisible, retreating to the spare room like it was his sanctuary. One evening, unable to bear the silence and distance anymore, I cornered him in the kitchen. Paul, what's going on with you? You're hardly here. And when you are, it's like you're not even my husband anymore. He avoided eye contact, stirring his coffee absent-mindedly. Work's a nightmare right now, Anna. Just piles of stress. I leaned back against the counter, my arms folded. I get stressed, Paul, but this feels like you're shutting me out. You're here, but you're not really here. He exhaled heavily, his gaze still fixed on his coffee. I don't know what you want me to say, Anna. I'm just really tied up with stuff. I wanted to believe him to understand, but something inside me screamed that there was more to it. Then there was Lucy, Paul's sister, who made it her mission to add to the tension. Each visit from her was a trial. She'd look around the house with a sneer and quip. Still stuck in this old dump, huh? I usually bit my tongue, but one day her taunts hit a nerve. Not all of us have the luxury to mooch off others, Lucy. I shot back. She just cackled, her voice grating on my nerves. Oh, look at you playing the martyr in a haunted house. Pathetic. I clenched my jaw, holding back a barrage of words. Paul, ever the silent bystander, offered no defense. His silence was like another jab, another confirmation of the growing gulf between us. The biggest shift, however, came with Elaine. One day she called for Lucy, her voice frail and desperate. Lucy, I need help with a bath. I can't manage on my own anymore. Lucy's response was cold and cutting. Help yourself, Mom. I'm not your caretaker. Elaine broke down in tears and my heart couldn't take it. Despite our rocky history, I couldn't leave her in that state. I helped her with the bath, and something between us changed that day. Elaine started to warm up to me, treating me less like an intruder and more like a daughter. It was a welcome change, but it also highlighted how far Paul and I had drifted apart. The house felt colder, emptier. Despite Elaine's newfound warmth towards me, the walls seemed to echo with the growing silence between Paul and me a chasm that widened with each passing day. Paul's late nights at work became a norm, and our conversations turned into mere whispers of their former selves. During one of these fleeting interactions, Paul dropped a new piece of news. Anna, I got an apartment near work, he said nonchalantly. I almost dropped the dish I was cleaning. An apartment? Why on earth would you need that? He leaned against the doorframe, avoiding my gaze. It's just practical, Anna. Saves me the commute, especially with the late nights. I felt a surge of anger and confusion. And you just decided this without talking to me. 
What are we, roommates now? He shrugged his indifference cutting deep. I thought you'd be happy, less stress about me coming home late. I shook my head in disbelief. Happy, Paul. This feels like you're living a double life. What's next? You'll tell me you have a second family. He sighed, rubbing his forehead. Don't be dramatic, Anna. It's not like that. I wanted to push further, to break through his nonchalant facade, but I knew it was futile. The conversation ended there, as did many of our conversations those days. The true shock came a few days later in a candid conversation with Elaine. We were in the living room, sharing a rare moment of calm, when she suddenly said, You know, Paul didn't buy that apartment with his money. I looked at her, puzzled. What do you mean? She hesitated, then continued, he used my savings. He said it was an investment. He even put it in my name. I felt my heart sink. He's been using your money, and you're okay with this. Elaine shrugged, a sad look in her eyes. I couldn't say no. He's my son, but I thought you should know I was speechless. Paul's secret apartment was one thing, but using his mother's savings and under the guise of an investment, it felt like the man I married was slipping away, replaced by this stranger with secrets and lies. A few days later, I confronted Paul about it. Paul, why didn't you tell me the apartment was bought with your mom's money? He was unapologetic, almost defiant, because I knew you'd react like this. It's an investment, Anna. It's not a big deal. I couldn't believe his audacity. Not a big deal. You're gambling with your mom's savings and keeping it from me. What else are you hiding? He turned away, ending the conversation with a dismissive wave. You wouldn't understand, Anna. It's business. Business. That word felt like a chasm between us, an excuse for everything that was going wrong in our marriage. Living in Elaine's old, dreary house was taking its toll on me. The walls, once probably vibrant, now echoed a somber tone, and every creaking floorboard seemed to whisper secrets. One day, I just couldn't take it anymore. Elaine, have you ever thought about renovating the house? I asked over breakfast. It could use some freshening up. Elaine looked up from her tea, surprised. Renovate? I haven't thought about it in years. It's such a big task. I nodded, feeling a spark of enthusiasm. I know, but it could really brighten up the place. Maybe just start with a new coat of paint or some new wallpaper. Elaine considered it for a moment. Well, I suppose it wouldn't hurt to bring some new life into this old house. But are you sure you're up for it? I smiled, eager for a project. Absolutely. It'll be a good change. And so it began. I threw myself into the renovation, painting walls, choosing wallpapers, and even attempting to restore some of the old furniture. It was hard work, but it felt good, like I was breathing life back into the house, and in a way, into myself. One day, while I was up to my elbows in paint, Paul walked in. He looked around, his expression one of shock and disbelief. What the hell, Anna? What are you doing in my mom's house? I stood up, wiping the sweat from my brow. I'm renovating Paul, like I told Elaine. It's time this place got a little love and care. Paul's face reddened. You had no right to start changing things without asking me. This is my family home, not some DIY project. I felt my temper rise. Your home. When was the last time you even cared about this place, Paul? I'm doing something good here. He took a step closer, his voice rising. You're overstepping, Anna. You always do this. Take control and push everyone else aside. I stared at him, incredulous. Take control? Paul, I'm trying to make this gloomy place livable. Maybe if you spent more time here, you'd see that. Before Paul could retort, Elaine walked in. What's all this noise about? Paul turned to her. Mom, did you know about this? About her changing the house. Elaine looked from me to Paul, then back again. Yes, I did, and I'm glad she's doing it. This house needed a change, and Anna's doing a wonderful job. Paul looked like he'd been slapped. But it's our family home. Elaine cut him off, her tone firm. It's my home, Paul, and I want this. Anna has every right to do what she's doing. 
Paul stormed out of the room, leaving me and Elaine in an awkward silence. I felt a mix of victory and sadness. The house was transforming, but the gap between Paul and me seemed to only grow wider. The day Elaine suffered her stroke, our world turned upside down. I was there, witnessing her sudden decline, her words slurring, her body weakening. Panic gripped me as I called for help, my voice quivering with fear. In the hospital, the grim reality set in. Elaine needed constant care. I looked to Paul for support, but he was distant, his eyes void of the son's concern I expected to see. Anna, I can't deal with this. I have enough on my plate, he said, his voice cold. I was stunned. You can't deal with this, Paul. She's your mother. He shrugged, his response cutting like a knife. Yeah, and she's been a burden for years. This is just the cherry on top. I couldn't hide my disgust. She's not a burden, Paul. She's family. She needs us. His laugh was bitter. Us? No, Anna, if she needs you. I've got other things to handle. I was left speechless, my respect for him sinking. I took it upon myself to care for Elaine. It was hard watching the once strong woman confined to a bed, dependent for every little thing. As I became Elaine's primary caregiver, Paul's visits grew rarer and his indifference more apparent. His visits were short, his conversations with Elaine brief and superficial. Then Lucy came. I overheard them in the living room, their words like venom. We should start thinking about the will dividing the assets, Lucy said, her voice devoid of any emotion. I burst into the room, fury coursing through my veins. How can you be so heartless, discussing her will right in front of her? She's still here. Lucy smirked, her words sharp. Oh, look who's talking, the saintly daughter-in-law. This is our family's matter. Stay out of it. Paul chimed in, his voice laced with cynicism. Anna, just drop it. It's practical to plan these things. No use pretending she's going to bounce back. I was aghast at his cruelty. Practical. She's your mother, Paul. How can you be so callous? He shrugged, his reply cold and detached. Life's callous, Anna. Better get used to it. I turned away, my heart heavy with disgust. The following weeks, I dedicated myself to Elaine's recovery, and to my surprise, she showed signs of improvement. Her fingers twitched, her speech cleared, she even managed a few steps. It was a miracle to me, but a nuisance to Paul and Lucy. Their true colors were now vividly clear. Their mother's plight was nothing more than an inconvenience, a hurdle in their path of inheritance. The betrayal stung deep, not just as a daughter-in-law, but as a human being. Life had settled into a grim routine. Elaine's health was a constant roller coaster with small victories overshadowed by the looming fear of the worst. Then it happened, another stroke, this time more severe. The call from the hospital felt like a punch to the gut. Elaine didn't make it. The funeral was a somber affair. I stood beside the grave, my heart heavy, watching as people paid their respects. That's when Paul arrived, and with him, a woman I didn't recognize, and two small kids clinging to her hands. Who's she? I whispered to myself, my eyes fixed on the unfamiliar woman. Paul approached, his expression unreadable. Anna, this is Carol, my wife, and these are our kids. I felt like I had been slapped. Your wife? When did this happen? He shrugged a coldness in his voice. A while ago. It's none of your business, Anna. I was speechless, my mind reeling. How could he? And during all this time with Elaine, Lucy was there too, her usual sneer in place. Finally showing your true colors, Anna, she sneered. It's a bit late for that. I glared at her, my voice laced with contempt. I was here for Elaine when you both abandoned her. Don't you dare judge me. Paul interjected. Let's just get this over with. We have other matters to discuss. After the funeral ended and the gathering moved to Elaine's house for the will reading, Paul and Lucy were like vultures, eagerly awaiting their share. The lawyer began reading the will and that's when the bombshell dropped. Everything, the house, the money, all of it was left to me. 
Paul's face went from smug to shocked. What the hell? This can't be right. Lucy was fuming. This is, she was our mother. How could she leave everything to this? This nobody? I stood there, stunned, not sure how to feel. Happy? Vindicated? It all felt hollow. Paul turned to me, his voice filled with accusation. You manipulated her, didn't you? Turned her against us? I shook my head, disbelief and anger mixing in my voice. I did nothing but care for her, which is more than I can say for you. The lawyer intervened. Elaine was very clear in her will. Lucy was seething. This is not the end. We'll contest this. There's no way we're letting her get away with this. As they left in a huff, I stood there alone in the house that was now legally mine. The walls that had witnessed so much pain, betrayal, and love. I looked around, feeling the weight of Elaine's last act of kindness and the burden of a broken family. The house felt different now, like it was echoing with Elaine's last wishes. I was sitting there, holding the will, still trying to get my head around everything. Elaine had left it all to me, and Paul and Lucy were raging mad about it. They came back the next day, all fired up. You really think you can just take everything? Paul burst out as soon as he stepped in. I looked up, tired but standing my ground. Elaine decided this, Paul. It was her choice. Lucy was red in the face, yelling, You tricked a sick old lady. We won't let you get away with this. I stood up, fed up with their nonsense. Tricked? I was there for her, unlike you too. She chose to leave it to me. Paul was fuming. So you think you've beaten us? You think you can just snatch everything away? I let out a heavy sigh. I didn't snatch anything, Paul. Elaine gave it to me because she knew I actually cared. Their yelling didn't stop, but it was just noise against the truth. I knew I was there for Elaine when they weren't. The lawyer showed up with a video Elaine had made. Her voice filled the room as she said it clear as day. I left everything to Anna because she was like the daughter I never had. She was there when my own kids weren't. She deserves it all. The room went quiet. Paul looked like he'd been punched in the gut, and Lucy started crying, finally realizing what they had done. After that, Paul and Lucy left, and all their threats just fell flat. I was alone in the big house, surrounded by the past and thinking about the future. I decided to divorce Paul. It was tough, but it had to be done. He and his new family had to move to a rental place. Lucy had her own mess to deal with. Her debts and bad choices were catching up to her. As for me, I was standing in my new house, feeling sad but also kind of excited. Elaine's will wasn't just about the house and money. It was like she was telling me to be strong and make my own way. I decided to start over, use what Elaine left me to build something new for myself. The house, once a reminder of tough times, was now a place for new beginnings.